Okay. The reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, and it's titled The Message to Sardis. And the an- oh, I'm reading from the NRSV for those who are interested. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. It's um, another powerful reading from Revelation. And because I've been on holidays and before that I had my week of COVID... Um, we can talk about what that was like later. I, it was pretty light. I mean, I've had all the vaccinations. I'm really grateful for all of that care in the background. And it was for me, it was like a bad cold. Um, Chris describes me as more vague. Uh, I dispute that, mainly because I don't, I don't remember anything much about it. But I was just, you know, I had a, a cough. It was a bit funny because a bit like... For a moment, I felt like I was living in a zoo because the, the room... I described myself as being like squirrelled away like a raccoon. And... <laughs> not even sure what a raccoon would be squirrelled away like, but it paints an image. So I was in the far back room and Chris would bring meals and put them in the little, the, the antechamber before my, my room and, and then sort of walk away and she had a really high cleaning regime in the background of all of that. It was exhausting for her. For me, it was just like, just coughing and, and you know, doing other stuff, writing things I thought were brilliant and until I looked back over them, I thought... Oh, really? I actually, I wrote that. I couldn't believe how bad it was. Um, And then I had this experience of being like living in a zoo because I'd have people coming to visit and where I was was sort of the front of the house that had come to the window and sort of peering. And I had, I had this, it was kind of like, you know when you go to the zoo and you think, I think there's a tiger in there somewhere. You think, oh no, it's a bit cold. Maybe it's gone into its other enclosure. So it was just really funny having people looking through the window and sort of, being me, COVID, the COVID version of me. So, but during that time, it was really lovely to look at the online materials. So thank you to Merv and Tim and others and, 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 and to Amanda as well for all the work that's done in the background to make that possible. So I loved looking at the service and seeing Gemma who'd stepped up at the last minute to fill in for me. It was just, it was great to see. And then I've been on holiday, so watching the services with Breck and then last week with Julie Trinick and Jack was leading communion. And it's just, it's just been a lovely experience to connect with people when I couldn't be here. So I hope that's true for others as well. And I noticed things um, that maybe you might have noticed too. Um, so I'll ask you, what, what have you noticed the last couple of weeks? When you think about the readings from Revelation, they've all been focusing on the letters to the seven churches in the early parts of Revelation. And just thinking about Gemma and Breck and Julie and people who've led communion and I think, think, um, think, I think, think that Eden was leading last week as well and, and brought the reading. What are the things you've noticed over the last few weeks? Anything at all that just rolls back from the back of your mind think, I noticed this. We've got quite a few talented but humble servants. Absolutely true. It, it is, a, you know, if we had the chance, there's a lot of people here with really diverse gifts and some really um, interesting ways of seeing how scripture works. But you're right, a lot of people who kind of sit on their hands a bit and when you see them, it's like, oh my goodness, this is extraordinary. That was my feeling. This is actually extraordinary. The the, the heartfelt readings, the communions, uh, the different ways that messages were brought. Anything else stand out for you? Jill? 
dedication and the love. Absolutely. Um, there's, it's not a put-on show. That's the other thing I've noticed. I'm not sure how many, where the churches are, but certainly it was really genuine and people were allowed to actually be themselves. There's a lot of variety in those people. Anything else that might have stood out for you? Mark? The willingness to step up when asked. The willingness to step up when asked. It's, it's a lovely gift. I've been in much larger churches where you can see the tumbleweeds blow past because... Isn't there somebody who's paid to do that job? All right, so, yeah, the willingness to step. Anything else you might have noticed? Tim? The depth of the word and the wisdom, and that's what I noticed too. Um, what a variety. You know, and I don't want to um, go on long and hard about this. I've got some things I'd like to say about the reading today. But, but part, of that, part of the reading from Revelation is around the the different identities of those seven churches. And so what I noticed was the different identities of those who bring the word and the readings and the reflections here and the integrity within them. So I, I mentioned Gemma. She stepped up at the last minute. That was a great address. You know, pulling stuff together from the ancient world. It was a really good you know, a great review of that particular church, but then to bring it into a contemporary setting in only the way that Gemma can, just allowed to be herself. How amazing. What a great gift. And then Breck, hmm. <laughs> you know, he's the most dramatic person I can think of when you put him up front. It's just natural to him to move his arms. I always feel a bit self-conscious and maybe I should just keep them safely in my pockets somewhere. But Breck is who he is. And then to see where Breck was going and, and to go back to the Old Testament, Balaam, Balaam's donkey. And I think, how refreshing to just get, you know, Balaam in the room and Balaam's donkey. And you think, thank you, Breck. It's a good reminder that sometimes the most wise personality in the household might be the dog by the back door who's got more of a clue of what's actually going on than the 25 brains sitting in the lounge room you know analyzing what happened in the in the election event or the cat at the end of the bed has got more you know switched on understanding of the universe than the person with the degrees you know cascading down their wall so I was really pleased with that with Breck and then Julie you know uh, such uh, again different you got Breck movement duly uh, really still um, just focusing on uh, what God had brought her what God had given her to bring for that day and she really enjoyed being here I think that was really clear and just a really clear message and I looked at it and I thought so there's you know three weeks what diversity what incredible diversity of all the things you've said different talents different abilities different integrities um, but just all there not a carbon cut out of just one sort of shape these are all people and then you get onto the communion leaders as well everyone is really different there's a place and for me in recovery and holidays that was really important to see because that that is a great gift in this church and sometimes I think when you're in a place you can sort of see oh well there's the gaps and there's the things that don't kind of work and you can almost forget or overlook but these are the things that actually do so when I was preparing for today, I looked over those different messages and thought, well, what, what are the remnants that need to be in the room for the reading today as well? Because it's, it, it, it's different again. It sounds similar, but it's actually quite, quite different in particular ways. Is there anything in the reading that stood out for you that Louise brought to us today? Mark? Absolutely. This is what I'm saying. It is important. And when you look at the other churches we've looked at in the ancient world, um, each of them has its own unique identity because the towns they're in, the cities they're in, are actually they're all unique in their own way too because of who leads them, because of their trade, because of their history, because of their relationship with Rome, because some of them had to be rebuilt at different stages. So that's all woven in there. And each of those churches as little as they are have a major role in unique areas and that's true for us as well isn't it you know Mornington is its own flavor of town and there's a whole bunch of different churches here and each of them have unique communities that they also tap into and this has a unique community that God has sort of carved out for us and it's really important to look at that and say what a privilege it is to be that church that God has seen from a distant way beyond it ever existed and thought about 
you here today and then what happens beyond today and all the other todays in front of this church. Not just in a Sunday service as we sit here and take communion, but what happens during the week? What happens in the op shop? What happens in the house? What happens between neighbours? What happens when we're shopping? What are the different levels of testimony that we actually bring because of who we are? They're all significant things. That's what I noticed in the reading. Anything else in the reading that stood out for you? Oh, sorry? Few that remain true. So there's something about the nature of the, the clarity of the, the truth and holding true to that. Uh, and we had a scattering of voices. Tim, I saw your hand and I think a few others called things out. So Tim, you first and then Jill. Yes, a promise and a warning. Two things. And I want to get back to that because they're the two things I saw. There's something about a diagnosis, which is a warning, and then there's something about the depth of love. So they're two of the key axes in it. Uh, Jill? Garments were white. Garments were white. Yeah, and we'll get onto that because it's interesting. Um, has anybody ever travelled like to India? Yeah? Uh, it's interesting how different clothing colours have different meanings for different people in different places. So in some areas, um, like in uh, our traditions, what does a bride traditionally wear? I know it's a bit different these days, but traditionally used to be white and it signifies a whole bunch of other things the white for purity blah 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 uh, but in other cultures no white is not the one you use because white is the color for death and mourning whereas for us black is the color for death and mourning i almost a bit partial to black maybe because i've lived in melbourne for too long and i think every time i see an indian person um, they look at black and they think ah oh, kind of like bad luck isn't it really so they, and that's why they often dress really brightly because, because the colours signify something else about the zest and the beauty and the wonder and the dynamic nature of a hopeful kind of life. Why would you cloud that up with, with black? So clothing actually does signify and the clothing here is that sense of the, for those who haven't um, lost their dignity, who haven't lost their sense of self, who, who are actually wearing clothing befitting someone who is clothed in Christ, covered by the blood of the Lamb, the person who has been set aside for God's good purposes. Not to be holy than thou and, there, and therefore looking you know, with a long robe down the end of the street, oh, there's the holy person, but to be able to be in the street, talking to people in the gutter, being able to be available to others because that's where the holiness is most clearly seen. So that's where this reading goes. It's got those two things you talked about, Tim. There is a there is a, a serious warning and a diagnosis, and there is an incredible hope. And that white robe is part of that signifier of the just sheer beauty of what it is to be a person who is clothed in those things that are really meaningful and good. So they're the two things I want to um, begin to talk about today, is just those two things, the diagnosis and the nature of the clothing. And to get into that, I wanted to um, just read a verse from, from Titus. I've got it here somewhere. Because uh, I think this sort of anchors where we're going. So this is from Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So there's something about the flavour of that. So the reading from Revelation is actually it's about salvation and who you are. And it's about what you've been saved for and saved with. You've been saved with love and with great passion. And there's something about that love and that passion that is the most pure nature of you. And when that's lost and buried and you're walking around in the old rags of whatever your previous life might have been, it's just really, really sad. Because then the church can't be the witness it's designed to be, an individual person of faith is not going to be pouring out that witness in the little cards and the letters and the flowers and the casseroles and the kind words to the person at the cash register. It all becomes something a little bit different. So that Titus reading, I think, sort of sits in the background of part of the Revelation one. It's the reason for the, these words that actually help us understand 
why the diagnosis is so clear, but to realise it comes from love and not from harsh judgement. It comes from the reality of what a diagnosis might lead to, but the love that drives the reason for the diagnosis. Does that... It probably doesn't make sense, but I'm hoping it might as we get through. So yesterday, um, thinking about diagnoses, and I know there's a few people probably this week looking for a diagnosis of one thing or another. Um, uh, Chris has been on another incredible journey of health, which she does not need. No, uh, it all started with down at Phillip Island. She had a, a bit of an, an ear thing, a bit of vertigo. So we cut our holidays short. We're going to do other things. We just went home. Then she's sitting in the backyard and feels something in her eye and thinks maybe an insect got in. And then that's getting sore, goes to a doctor. Here, take these drops, wash your eye out. And by a few days later, it's still pretty bad, getting itchier, uh, goes to another doctor. Could be, you know, orbital salitis. Here, take these antibiotics. Then by yesterday morning, it's like, oh, this is not getting any better, is it? So we find ourselves um, in the beautiful um, reality therapy of, uh, of Maroon to Hospital Emergency, uh, which I always love going to. It's, I don't know what you feel about emergency. I know you have to sit there for a while. We didn't actually have to wait that long. We actually chose the timing wrong because there's no greater testimony to community sport than sitting in a waiting room on Saturday afternoon and seeing it fill up with busted ankles. There was a footy player with his you know, shoulder dislocated and they're all sitting there in all their different team colours. You think, yep, this, this is the part of sport that's never talked about. <laughs> the drain on the health area. Uh, and then it gets kind of funny because you sit with people you've never met before and there was a lady who had a hand up at the, at the triage desk and complaining about a whole bunch of things and she was really kind of loud. She wasn't unpleasant, but you could hear everything and she's saying, I could show you photos and I turned quietly and said to Chris, and they're probably in like four different kinds of resolution because she was giving so much detail over everything and the lady beside me heard that and she starts weighing into this conversation. I had to spend the next five minutes closing her down because <laughs> I think, I don't want to be sitting here because emergency is also a quiet zone. No matter what pain people are agonising through, they just sit there and they wait. Like, you know, cows lined up for milking. It's just, they just sit there and then they disappear one up. So Chris is there, she's got this rash on her face and it is shingles and it hadn't been picked up. So she's got a wagon load of pain. She's got to really watch now for her eye. So in preparing for today, I was thinking about how important a good diagnosis is. And some of you will know that from physical kind of ailments as well. You weren't sure what it was. The right diagnosis says, you're going to live, take these, it's going to be okay. Give it a few more days. Or the diagnosis that says, actually, from this point on, your life will change. And these are the new friends you'll have who'll be your oncology support or whoever else it's going to be. So diagnosis is really, really crucial. Spiritual diagnosis is really crucial as well. And that's how this letter starts. With Jesus speaking to John the Divine, John the writer of Revelation, saying, I want you to take this, this is my translation, I want you to take this to my really good friends because here's a church that's in trouble and they don't really know exactly what trouble they're currently in, but here's a diagnosis. I'm sending it with love because I really value this church, I really want them to thrive, but they're dead, but they think they're alive. I've thought about the men I've met over the years who've had the, the terrible result from the prostate examination and they get the result back thinking, and I've got to go in and I'm going to have to have this and it's going to be surgery and my life's going to, maybe it's going to change dramatically in ways I can't even imagine. And they look, look at me in the eye and they'll say, the worst thing about this is I don't even feel that there is anything wrong. I just feel like I've always felt and yet I know as soon as I get into that specialist office I'm going to hear things I don't want to hear, I'm going to have to be part of processes I don't really want and I have to adapt myself now to a life that I wasn't quite anticipating. It's not always a horror story, it's not always terrible but it's a transitional point but it's a diagnosis you need because if it's left unchecked the trajectory is long, difficult and does not end well. So intervention is really important. So this is what Jesus does through the letter in Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. He looks at a church that he loves and says, you've got to get it to the messenger, to the leader, 
so that they know they think they're doing really well, but they're dead. Now, how can a church be possibly thinking it's doing really well and yet kind of it actually it's, it's not well at all? Call it out. Uh, have you had any experiences or can you imagine why a church might think it's amazing when actually it's just, you know, dying by degrees or already dead? Any examples? Lots of people attending. Lots of people attending is great. I know that feeling. I remember being asked back in probably about 1995, what's the secret for how, how come this church that you're in, how is it growing? And, and there's a real, um, uh, there's a pride problem for a lot of people in ministry who can suddenly think, maybe it's me. Maybe it's because you know, I'm just an amazing preacher. Maybe it's because I'm just great with people. But the reality is, and I knew it enough then to say, well, actually, all, what's our secret? We open the doors. Why do people come? Because we're with a whole bunch of people who are what I began to realise, they're like positive hub focused people. They're the ones who look for the new arrivals. They're the ones who say, oh, mate, have you got anywhere to go for lunch? Come to my place. So it's not just the minister or leadership team. It's got to be the whole church that actually has a sense of, I'm going to be a beacon and a light and a lighthouse. And it's not John's job it's actually my job and I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it because not because I'm asked but because I think flipping heck I want to do it that was the secret for how in the early 90s Ringwood Church of Christ kind of grew and thrived because there were a lot of people just thinking I want to do that come around for a barbecue come around to watch a movie let's go for a walk along uh, up. let's go to Warrandyte and have a coffee you know, people just thinking that way so sometimes the large numbers hide the, hu- the hubris um, I remember talking to a minister who said, I thought we were doing really well with evangelism until I actually looked at it all and I realised we were just mopping up people from churches that were small and dying and people looking for something thrilling. And when I analysed it, I thought, we're actually not saving people or we haven't done a baptism for years. So that's, that's the issue. You can look at something that becomes the benchmark that I th- we're doing well, we've got numbers bottoms on seats, the offerings really, you know, you think of all the KPIs, key performance indexes, you can imagine them all. We're doing really well, look at the size of the Sunday school, look at the youth club. But in the heart of it, actually it may be nothing. I always think of, you know, when Jesus got to Jerusalem, um, where's the biggest centre of religious activity in Jerusalem when Jesus arrives? The temple. Some of you, Barbara, know you've been to Jerusalem. You've only seen the ruins, but you've got an idea of that was massive. Key performance indicator, massive, huge building. Huge, you know, key performance indicator, huge numbers of people. They come from all the known world to bring their sacrifices and their offerings. That place is pumping. Of a night, the huge golden lamps lighting up all of Jerusalem. You know, amazing. And Jesus looks at it and what does he say? Yeah, yeah, throw this mountain into the sea. You know, you can have everything, big, shiny, bright, the music, the band, the everything, and yet in the heart of it, it's just ashes. It's not. So in the start of this letter, Jesus says, actually, I am the one, the seven lampstands, the seven spirits. What's he talking about? I'm talking about my friendship with the Holy Spirit is so great, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you. Because while you can look at all the key performance indicators and say, we can hold our heads up, we're doing amazingly. Look at the amount of conversions or offering or whatever else we're doing. Jesus says, but, you know, in the key things, you are dead. You don't have an alive spirit at all. What's happened to you? Have you got to this point where you were thriving and alive and thrilled and now you're just looking at the bright and shiny things and saying, look at us, how wonderful we are. Let's go to the conference and bring all of our shiny, bright stories of of wonder to that. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you're missing the main thing. I remember Chris saying to me a long time ago after she'd gone to a conference in the US, one of the ministers there had said... um, Uh, You've got to be careful because what you win people with, you've won them too. So if you've won people with a huge musical event, then you've actually won them to a huge musical event. What happens when the musician leaves and that particular singer disappears off the edge of the universe somewhere or there's some other trouble? They just go because they were won to that. They weren't won to the heart of the Lord. 
So that means that Jesus looks at a church, I think, like Mornington, says, I, I love you guys, and I am the one who actually you know, looks at the, at the lamp that you are and the one who is dying to send and has died to send the Holy Spirit, the enlivener, into the very heart of who you are. And I'm, I'm not looking at how many seats there are that are full. I'm not even looking to what your offerings are like. I'm not Because they're all, they're all fruit, areas of fruit, but that's not the main thing. Jesus is saying, I'm just wanting to get the diagnosis right. And our diagnosis will be different to what the churches are in the, in, in, sorry, in the Asia Minor area. It's a different period of time. This is a different town than Sardis or somewhere else. But Jesus, I think, looks the same way. I can see what your works are. I can see what you're holding up as the fruit. And I want to celebrate it. But, you know, there is more. Now, what does that more look like? thought about it um, strangely about what happens when we pray. This gets back to diagnosis. Um, I'm going to ask for a quick show of hands, one to keep you awake, and I realise I'm thinking think I'm going on longer than I'd thought. That's what a holiday and maybe COVID does. Um, but have you ever had that, that kind of circumstance? You're just out shopping somewhere and suddenly your, your phone pings and it's like, um, oh, my goodness, um, Judy's got COVID number three. My goodness. So you, yeah, so you think, maybe I'll just send Jude a quick note uh, praying for you. Anybody done that sort of thing? Get a note on your phone praying for you? Or maybe let's wind back the technology. You're shopping down at uh, Woolies and uh, you bump into... Um, into I was going to choose one now. I'm going, you bump into Barb and Jill. They've been out having a coffee together. And, and Barb says to you, oh, did you hear about... Da da da. And you think, oh, I hadn't heard about that. So you make a mental note, and you say to you, and, and you say to Barb and Jill, oh, I hadn't realised that's happened. I'm, I'll make sure I pray. So that's the sort of thing you do. You pray. What happens next? You follow up. Now, I I had to do some hard reality therapy on myself, and I thought, what does that follow up look like? Because when you first hear the news, it's not always the most convenient time. It's pinged, and you're in the middle of you know buying your, your ham and chicken from the, from the, sort of, from the deli and you don't, you don't want to lose your place in the line because you've been holding that ticket for like 20 minutes. You think, oh my goodness, all these tourists will I ever leave? Um, so it's not always the convenient time when the call comes, but you've still said, I want to pray. So what do you do? Well, then you, you benchmark, oh, well, I'm going to have a coffee after this. So when I'm sitting down having the coffee and reach for the Herald Sun that trash of a magazine that it might be. Um, I'm going to spend the time rewinding that conversation with Jill and Barb and I'm just going to make sure I do pray. So I'm sitting there and I'm praying. What happens then? You might, you might, you might get good news. So you're watching what happens next. Maybe there's other, other layers I need to pray for. One of the things I've realised is that my mind often splinters and goes off in other directions. And so I'm sitting there having my coffee thinking I really need to pray and I want to be, be disciplined about this so I'm going to make some time and then suddenly and I'm just going to pick on, on Don and Tops maybe uh, so I'm thinking about praying for Tops who's, who's fine at the moment <laughs> <laughs> praying for Tops but then I'm finding but then I'm thinking I'm praying for Don um, how did why did who's the problem that's right. <laughs> and this is where I know you're not a problem Don um, but I'm but sometimes when that's happened to me, I've thought, well, I'm, I'm praying for the, for the wife who's in hospital and that's going to be a recovery time for them. But then I've realised, you know, her poor hopeless husband, as wonderful as he was as, a, as, a, as an aeronautical engineer or whatever else it might have been, cannot cook to save themselves. And so sometimes, no, Don's not like that, but sometimes the journey of prayer begins to open up the other drawers of the pastoral ramifications. would be Maybe it's a good idea. I might just go back to Woolies and buy that little thing of flowers and drop it in uh, around it on Topsies before I go home while it's still fresh in my mind so that they'll know I actually am thinking of them and I'm aware and I'll follow up. I'll make a phone call maybe tomorrow. Today might be too soon. So prayer becomes an alive thing in the space. And once it's alive in the space, then God begins to bring other things into your mind. Maybe I could do a casserole. You know, if, if um, Pat was sitting here today, some of you will remember Pat in the foyer, she'd go home and she'd think, 
Mm, slices and a few small casserole quiches. That's what they're going to really need to just make sure they're, they're nourished. So people go to their love language, the thing that's meaningful to be able to bring to the someone else. And now you've got a live prayer. Now that's the difference between being a church that's being diagnosed as dead or failing because it can find the words, we'll pray for you. But that's as far as it goes. A Holy Spirit-filled church says, I'm going to pray for you sit down and have coffee over it maybe that's going to be in my prayer list before I close my eyes of a night and when I wake up in the morning I'm going to give Wendy or Graham a call as soon as I can just to make sure that things are okay in their family um, and then you see what God does and then you celebrate you know oh they're back home how am I Mavis back home how amazing is that thank you God oh there's more prayer needed there's another drop down list Okay, more diagnosis, more surgery, and you start working your way through. And that becomes then that heart of compassion and pastoral care that begins to emerge. Does that make sense to you? And that's, that's how I think, that, that's a healthy church. You can have a healthy church of three people. If they're doing that, that's an extraordinary ripple effect through a whole community of people who just get, I'm going to pray. So I think in Jesus' mind, as he sends this message to the church in the reading today, it is, I do love you, but you've got an illness that you don't quite realise just how unwell you are and it will take you out. But there are some of you who are still alive and well. So I want to remind you about that garment, that, the white garment, that sense of being really held and, and encouraged and nurtured and what that means for you as the future unfolds. So this reading, some, when I reviewed a whole bunch of different sermons about it, some people only find the negative... And so the message is always, you are just dead. Look at you, hopeless people. You know, bang the, the pulpit, drag out some more negative things. It's going to be really hard for you on the day of judgment. You know, the Lord's kind of come hard on you. you no, know, great price has been paid, but we're going to, you know, and I know that sounds like a parody, but people do that because they forget there's actually two, two main tracks in this reading. There is a diagnosis, but it's a diagnosis of love. And the key... The key reason for the letter is because I want you all to be the people who have that sense of I'm really clothed. I'm clothed with the presence of the living God. I'm clothed with the wonder of Christ. And I'm walking out into the world as imperfect as I am with that sense. And you can remake a family. You can remake a friendship. You can remake a neighbourhood. You can remake a whole nation just on that alone remembering what you're clothed with. I often say it, you know, gossip is easy, being negative is easy, being cynical, which I think is one of my personal gifts, it's not, <laughs> is dead easy. And you'll always find a happy chorus of people to jump on board. But to remember who you are, you know, Christ died for me. He, he did. And for you, and for us, and for this neighbourhood. And... What a terrible thing it would be to look at the face of Jesus and say, it doesn't mean that much to me now. It's more important that I gossip or that I go to the low, find the low road rather than finding the road of grace and mercy. So I want to encourage you. The letter today is for the contemporary church still. Don't look at what the fancy KPIs are. They won't tell you who you really are. Who you really are is when you're at home, when you are on your own and where you find yourself on your knees or metaphorically on your knees because some of us will never get up again, um, <laughs> where you are in, in your heart as you pray for a world that's twisting and turning, as you pray for yourself and your friends and your neighbours. And if you can see that, you'll see the absolute love that this letter is sent with. Well... I did ask John, seeing it's my first time up here, um, if I could just share a little bit about Cops and myself, because you, you don't know much about us. You may not want to after this morning. <laughs> but um, we were married at Coburg Church of Christ in 77. Fell madly in love in 76. Still are. <laughs> <laughs> Boost my confidence. Um, and... We worshipped there for about the next five years. But then we moved house, so we moved over to, um, to Doncaster in 80, 83. Doncaster Church of Christ, that is. And then um, in 84, disaster struck because Tops 
got cancer and um, it was life-threatening cancer. In fact, the oncologist said to me that she only had five years to live at the most. Um, and here it is 38 years later. And God must have done something right and I gave a little bit of a hand. Um, no, it's quite amazing really. So when I was 85, I was um, invited to, um, to be an elder at Doncaster, which absolutely floored me, I must say. They gave me a couple of weeks to think about it and then there was a knock on the door one Friday night. I opened the door and I called out the top and I said, oh, I said three men are from here from Touch Lotto. Actually, it was the chairman of the board and the uh, two of the elders just to see what, um, what decision I'd made. Anyway, I became an elder and I was for, for five years. And then in um, 1990, um, I was a painting contractor for 23 years. In 1990, I received a call one Sunday evening. It was about half past nine and strangely enough, it was most unusual for me, I was lying on the bed. And um, the phone rang and I picked it up and it was Chris Ambrose who was the chairman of the board at Coburg Church. And um, he asked me if I would, be, would I would give some thought to being a lay minister over at Coburg Church. If so, would I come over for an interview with the board? Well, I was so stunned, I just, just couldn't believe it. And yet, having said that, I really did feel God had something planned for us. And so um, I went over for the interview, and from, th from that night on, um, when we all agreed, I thought, well, there, there are a lot of gamblers over there at that church. Um, I'm, I'm taking a gamble, and God's taking a huge gamble. Uh, but um, we had a lovely ministry over there and we saw God do some incredible things. And from there we went to Oakley Church um, and from Oakley we went to Ringwood to be uh, there with, with John and Chris and the ministry team there and I was blessed to be minister to seniors there for seven years and um, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful seven years. And from there we moved to Bright and uh, I continued in ministry there for three years and then retired, ha ha. Uh, I have a funny old saying, ministers never tire, retire, they just go out to, to pastor, um, which, which we do. Uh, I'm not a head person, I'm a heart person, and I absolutely love people. It doesn't matter what their station is in life or what their background is, whether they're Christians or not, I absolutely love people. Um, that, um, something you didn't mention this morning, John, I, which I had a look at, was that verse 5 of that reading from Revelation those who win the victory will be clothed like this in white. Of course, you mentioned that. And I will remove their names. I will not remove their names from the book of the living. In the presence of my father and his angels, I will declare openly that they belong to me. I just find that so astounding. And of course, it's also back in Matthew chapter 10 and um, Luke chapter 12. In Matthew 10, it says, if anyone declares publicly that he belongs to me, I will do the same for him before my Father in heaven. I mean, it's just so astonishing that Jesus was prepared to die for us. It's just beyond my imagination. And then in heaven, he's prepared to vouch for us. A vouch isn't a word you find in the Bible. I don't think you'd even find it in Eugene Peterson's The Message. But um, that's what he is prepared to do for us as well as die for us. He's prepared to vouch for us before our Heavenly Father. I um, remember a chorus from a long, long time ago, and perhaps some of you older folks might remember it too. Now I belong to Jesus. Anybody remember? Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the sake of time alone, but for eternity. And as much as we enjoy life as Christians here on earth, wow. What a day it'll be when we're there before the Lord in, in heaven. And we take communion together in reverence and in, in memory of what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us, day in and day out. We are so richly blessed. We are so fortunate and we are so privileged to be members of his family. Be able to call Jesus our brother. Wow, what, a, what an amazing privilege. Now, before we um, share our communion, I must mention the offering. We had a young chap at um, Brighton when he presided. He always held up, the, there were two offering plates, and he'd say, always give what's right, not what's left.
I'm not saying anymore. <laughs> always give, yes, I will. Always give what's right, not what's left. Let's bow in prayer and give thanks today for our offering. Father God, we thank you and we cherish our relationship with you. Um, words are beyond us at times because you are so wonderful to us and the fact that you gave your life, you made that commitment, Lord, we really need to commit ourselves to you in every possible way. Lord, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of being here today and sharing our faith journey together. And we thank you in and through the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So I invite you to come forward and share communion together. Thank you.